Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami So, a body contemplation talk. These are some of my favorite. I gave a retreat last year called All the Unpopular Buddhist Topics. And this was a headliner, but it's also one of the most important topics, and it's not spoken about in the West very often. One of the counterintuitive places or parts of the Buddhist path is a suba which translates as not beautiful. A uh, means not, and suba, beautiful. Not attractive. And with body contemplation, um, there's a few different approaches that the Buddha speaks about. There's looking at the body in terms of the 32 parts, which we chanted earlier today. There's looking at it in states of decay. And there's looking at it in terms of its element constituents. Uh, and granted, it's a paradigm, earth, air, fire, water, that was from an old era. But the mind understands these um, distinctions of solidity, liquidity, movement, and heat. And it can divide up what seems such a cohesive whole as the body into just these constituents very intuitively when the mind is calm. And it's important to see that what we're doing in these practices is not looking at things in a morbid light. We're just looking at truth. We understand at some level our delusion about death. You know, there's so many movies and tropes in popular culture about someone discovering that they're going to die and making big changes in their lives. We all know that we would probably live a little differently if we truly understood our mortality. But our delusion about the body is so deep that we don't know at all that we're deluded. And yet, this is one of the key locuses of identity. And wound through it are so many threads of defilement, of greed, of hatred, of delusion. And where we love the high wisdom teachings of Zen, what was your face before you were born, these koans, what body contemplation does, it rips apart the deluded sense of self and all the defilement founded on it in a way that's nitty, that's nitty gritty down to earth and hard to articulate the potency of. It's a central aspect of every deep tradition I know in Thai forest tradition, it's not some kind of practice you hear about every now and again. It's the key to the first level of enlightenment in many cases. You develop a calm mind with samadhi, samatha. And then once the mind has rested in a state of calm, it'll begin to move again. It's like the cup of samadhi is full. And when it begins to move, all the Thai ajans, or most of them will say, that's when you contemplate the body. Because the locus of identity wound into that first khanda aggregate of form of the body is so foundational that seeing through it even a little bit can decrease defilement in every aspect. And seeing it through it completely is often paramount to stream entry, the first level of awakening. If you think this is a fringe practice, read the Terigata or the Terigata, the verses of the elder monks and nuns, and you'll see again and again how the breakthrough for those monks and nuns was very, very often seeing through the body. And it's important to say it's different than having a negative body image Negative body image is seeing your own body and comparing it to other bodies 
and seeing your body as less attractive than others. Body contemplation in the Buddhist sense is seeing the body just for what it is, all bodies, just this amalgamation of parts and constituents and elements and carbon. And it's just that much. And we honor it. Um, we use it as a vehicle for awakening. But our default mode of relation to the body is not neutral. We are deeply attached. And sometimes you only see that when it's compromised. Um, one of the, I think, hints at this might be when you're bitten by a mosquito. And instead of it just being a small uh, annoyance, a sensation on the skin, there's a real sense of indignation, like, how dare? How dare it? And you can feel in that moment how the sense of self kind of is an aura around the body. So if we see through the body, if we see it clearly as not attractive, as just what it is, we still can honor it, but we no longer, but we undercut, we hamstring the defilements wound into it to a great degree. We soften lust. And this is no small thing either. Uh, I think in 2023, the world spent $570 billion on the cosmetics industry. We spent a lot of money on hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin. And those are the first five objects that monastics are given to contemplate when they ordain. This is how foundational this practice is. Our first meditation object given by the Buddha was not, and by the lineage, it's not breath, it's not metta, it's hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin. Because if you see through this mantle of clay, then you can see through to the heart more. And this is why it's also a great act of compassion. It's so, there's such a subtle and also unsubtle violence in looking at people as sexual objects. And you see it at work um, in even, you know, a situation like a community like this. You see how people will kind of gravitate towards some and not gravitate towards others and driven by these tidal forces of sexuality. And we want to tr create a community where lust is left at the door. Because what, an un what a subtle violence if someone is approached as a sexual object or ignored as someone not of interest. We are trying to look to the heart. There's a beautiful sutta where uh, the king of Kosambi comes to a bhikkhu. And he says, how do you young uh, monastics go forth? in the prime of life and give up lust. And the monk responds and says, the blessed one says, those women who are the same age as your mother, think of them, set up the idea that they are your mothers. Those women who are the same age as your sisters, think of them, set up the idea that they are your sisters. Those women that are the same age as your daughters, think of them, set up the idea that they are just your daughters. Can we look at those around us as siblings, as parents, as children? And what a gift that would be. Acknowledging the gendered language coming from a monk, but just invert it if you're a woman or have different sexual proclivities, whatever it is. The point is that we see this is not a morbid practice. This is something if you can see through that veil of the body, the heart becomes much more visible. And you can just hold this form, these clothes that we've taken on for a few years in the Buddhist sense, just as a set of clothes we're wearing. And it's so much more light, rather than getting into this comparison of how I look or want to look, how attractive I am, how attractive this person is. Ajahn Panyavado says that about 90% of the judgment we give or lay on to someone when we meet them is based on their appearance. So what a gift just to put that all down and just be with someone's heart.
What a gift that would be if we could create a community where that's how we come to everyone here. And it's against the stream. The machine of lust in the world is about as strong as it's ever been. Pornography is an enormous force, um, as are all the more subtle and not so subtle uh, steerings towards sexuality. So it's okay to bend the other way. It's okay to have a tool in the belt, in the tool belt that will let you undercut those forces so that you can come into contact again with someone's heart. So the practices themselves are really fun um, and interesting and worth playing with. If you're a greed type, these are very safe. Uh, you can use body contemplation as a chief practice. Uh, Ajahn Anand, my teacher, was given blood as his chief object for a year, and it was one of his key objects. The bones are a very powerful object for people. If you're an aversive type and find that you tend towards aversion, then be more careful because these are really potent practices and you can get very grumpy based on them. But what you do is after the mind has grown calm for a time, it'll begin to move. And it won't be the movement of distraction or escape, but rather the movement of a mind that's just full. It's gone as deep as it can and it begins to emerge and have this hunger for something to chew on. And that's when you steer it towards body contemplation. The first way of doing this is to look at the 32 parts of the body. There's this list in the books. You can look it up online, 32 parts of the body. But you also can just basically what you do is with that calm mind that's moving, bring up different body parts and see where the mind gets interested. So you can go through the bones, think of the bones, feel them. Imagine taking an arm bone and just breaking it and having it dissolve into calcium. You can use words, bone, stone, bone, stone. You can remember how your vertebrae are no different than river stones. Bones, stones, they're just calcium. You can think of how the water in the body is similar in salinity to um, that of the ocean, how the bones are basically just coral. You can try for that. The hair of the head is also a very good object. And this is also one of the indicators of how deluded we are, is if you're eating soup and a piece of hair falls in it, it becomes a lot less appetizing which is strange because it's your hair. Or have some soup, spit into it, and see how appetizing it is then, which is completely counterintuitive. We're missing something, and deep down we know there's something we're missing. But we're so deluded we don't know how much we're missing it. Only with the calm mind that's powerful, the body becomes strong through movement, the mind becomes strong through stillness. So with the afterglow of sam samadhi, you can see through these things. So other things you can do um, is when a sexual fantasy begins to rise, cut it off fast because you know where that goes and it just gets worse. Um, and so things you can do are take off the person's eyelids, a lot less attractive. <laughs> it's just the eyelids. Um, hmm? In imagination. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. <laughs> yeah, we need a disclaimer on this one. <laughs> the litigation begins. Um, <laughs> take off the face in imagination. The skull of someone looks very similar, whether they're male or female. It's just a skull. Imagine what happens if you don't wash the body for two days, for three days the oil begins to accumulate and soak into the clothes. This body is constantly oozing out of nine orifices and out of all the skin. 
it's not a closed system. Oil's constantly moving out of it. You can remember that when you look at a body, the skin, the hair, everything, all you see is dead flesh. The eyes look alive, but that's only because they're moist. And if you really saw live cells of the skin, it would be excruciatingly painful. All the skin on the surface is dead. It's flaked dead skin. You can, um, let's see, what else is there to do? There's some fun ones. So what you do is you move through the body parts, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, the wrappings or bones or blood, and just find one that kind of interests the mind. And that's how you know it's the right one. And then you can just kind of experiment. Contemplating the body is sort of something you have to figure out. But play around. You can make a movie of you know, just cracking open the bone and watching it dissolve into dust. Um, you can really imagine that it's the same as the stones around you. And these are just really good tools to have in the tool belt for when you need them. And a really good metric is these shouldn't lead the mind to become dark or morbid or distressed. You should become, the mind should become luminous and bright. And this is a good point. It's not morbid. It, imagine what happens if the heart, luminous, actually believes that it's this mass of blood and flesh and calcium, really believes that this is what it is. All you're doing is dispelling that delusion. And then the heart can rest and become more and more centered on what it, on its true resonance, which is luminous, free light. And you're preparing for death. If you truly see the body, if you lessen your attachment to it, you're preparing for the moment when it fails. And I remember being in a hospital in Ubon, and the ward was filled and the hallways were filled in northeastern Thailand. And there's the scent of fluids and pus and vomit. And there's groans and whimperings and this huge sense from almost every person there of being betrayed by their body in one fell swoop. This is you not needing to be betrayed by your body when you don't have the strength to see through that happening. You're preparing by understanding what the body is. It does its best. You have metta for it. You appreciate it. But but you know where what will happen eventually. You'll have to give it back. And you can also remember how when you're sick, the body won't obey you. Sometimes if you're really ill, you tell it to move and it won't. You tell it not to get sick, it won't. Or it, it won't not get sick, it will get sick. You do not own this body. It never was yours. The elements in it are constantly changing out. The earth is constantly coming in and going out. The water is different in this body than it was yesterday. The air is too. Where's the continuity that is so much you? The other thing to do, and this is better for those who have a strong aversive nature, is the element contemplations. And in Buddhism, the elements we point to our earth, air, fire, water. And you can hear those at first and think, you know, what is this kind of medieval system? But this is a contemplation of the mind. And these are ways that the mind can intuitively divide up the body. Right now, we have a very arbitrary division, which is this frame of the body and everything else. It's quite arbitrary. There's not really a strong separation between this and that. So this is another way of dividing it up. But if you want, you can think of the elements as the periodic table. We're about 20% carbon by weight, about 60% oxygen. We got some other stuff mixed in there. But if the mind is calm and you look to the elements, this can dissolve the sense of self in a way that's difficult to articulate. Ajahn Blian, a really famous teacher in Thailand, was one at, once asked, you know, I contemplate the repulsiveness of food and the elements, and you know, which one of those is more important? And he said, contemplating the repulsiveness of food, which is something you can do to 
dispel lust for food, is child's play. It's kindergarten, was his word. Contemplating the elements is high dhamma. And I've met monks, I think, who are arahants, who all they talk about is the elements. They'll be like, this is just earth and water and air and fire. That's it. In my experience, it can take um, a deep degree of calm to really hold this contemplation in mind. But if you can do it, just when the mind is calm, begin to contemplate. All this body is is earth. The bones are just calcium, like the stones around you. The earth you're standing on is made of the chipped up, dissolved bones of millennia, of millions of years of animals before you. There's no distinction between your bones and those bones. The water, every drop of water you see has been the blood of other animals before you. Your, wa your blood is just the rainwater of others, uh, of the world. And this doesn't have to be a morbid contemplation. You are just nature. There's no distinction between you and nature. This is one of the key insights of the Buddhist path is all things proceed in accordance with natural law, dhammata, dhammata, including the body. There was a disciple of Ajahn Lee, a famous teacher who said, my friends keep coming up to me and saying, what do you care if we punch you? You know, this body's not you, right? And Ajahn Lee said, you should tell them that you're borrowing it and have to take good care of it. So we're borrowing these, that's it. And if you really contemplate the elements, either you can come up with a phrase that really hits home with a calm mind, just like earth, earth, water, blood, water, blood, rain, water, earth, stones, whatever it is. What might happen is your mind will really begin to see something it never has seen before. You know, there's people here who come and they start doing body contemplation or even without direction, their mind just begins to understand. And, you know, one of them talked about one morning she was just in the shower and feeling her ha hair and just this word, burlap, burlap, and feeling her face and thinking lump, lump. And there's this strange, you can feel the ring of truth in those phrases. There's something that the mind is seeing that it never has seen before. You might wake up once you start doing body contemplation and understand that just before the mind has really gotten hold there's this moment of clarity where you realize the body and the bed and the earth are all the same. There's no real distinction between it. It's all the same. And there's a reason why the base of infinite space, which is one of the formless attainments of deep concentration, is considered a doorway or resonant with the Brahma Vihara of compassion. Because if you see through the body this way, all the sharp edges of the world, people pushing against you and you pushing against them and the sense of claustrophobia that we don't even realize we're caught in begins to dissolve. And it all just seems so much lighter. And there's just a sense of the heart being what's really salient. And the natural response to that lack of jostling is compassion. And I think one of the key moments when people really understand what flashes of insight can be is after you've tried body contemplation from a mind of calm, and maybe you look at your arm and suddenly you realize it's not you. It's not you. So there's a story of Mechi Geo which roughly translates as Mother Crystal. And she was the, um, one of the foremost disciples of Ajahn Mun, the Thai forest master. She was considered enlightened. And she met Ajahn Mun in 1917 when he came on alms round through her village. And he kept telling her to meditate. She was 10 years old or something like that. 
And one night she tried, she just meditated, and her mind immediately dropped into this profound state of calm. She sat up all night, and she had a vision of her body laid out, and Ajahn Mun coming up and tapping it with his walking stick three times. And each time he said, the body being born must die. The heart is unborn and does not die when the body dies. It continues to move onwards, churning in accordance with its causes and conditions. The heart that is developed with purity of morality brings, brings countless boundless benefits and blessings. The heart steered wrong brings great harm. And the next morning she went to Ajahn Mun and apologized. She said she'd accidentally fallen asleep all night because she didn't know what the concentration was. And he just began to laugh and said, no, that was, that was deep insight. So once again, there's a reason why this practice is taught less than it's a lot more, it's a lot easier to talk about developing loving kindness than contemplating your kidneys. But this is a real important practice. It's important to have in your tool belt. It will deepen your samadhi, it will undercut defilement, and it will be one means towards cutting off that flow of the heart which leads towards objectification, towards the subtle violence of lust. And it will help you hopefully see people more and more as, uh, you know, in, in the light of kindness. So, good luck. Sadhu Anumodami. So we have time for questions. If you want to raise your hand, we'll have a mic runner get the mic to you. Just say your name and the question. If you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand. <clears throat> and I think we may have someone with their electronic hand already, or perhaps not. Ah. Joseph, did you have a question? Yes, thank you, Ajahn. Um, I remember when I first started out um, so practicing bad. meditation during the start of COVID lockdown, um, I tried doing the body contemplation, the un and it was very difficult. It was very difficult. I think I had a lot of anger, a lot of aversion. And I remember being really horrified, humiliated, and disgusted by just being able to constantly feel my the veins moving, like the blood pumping. And I felt very much disgusted by that. And I remember all the hearing all these analogies about like removing the eyelids it felt very violent. It felt like it was hard to um, disassociate it from being literal and getting empathetic distress. And now I find it to be quite joyful after having done a lot of metta meditation, a lot of calming, a lot of compassion. So uh, I highly recommend, um, for example, now I can uh, praise it and uh, recommend it to everyone. I just realized recently that um, the elements contemplation that you're describing, it manifests when I feel the blood pumping, it's more just water, water. It's a different, there's neutral perceptions. There's pleasant perceptions, unpleasant perceptions, and then neutral perceptions like the elements. And I'm wondering, I still get a little bit tense. I still get a little bit, uh, a lot of empathetic distress. And I'm trying to find um, gentle perceptions of uh, um, Asuba, if there's such a thing. So like um, x-ray vision, trying to do like a Superman power, just kind of like scanning other people's bodies instead of taking them apart. Or... Um, what's another one I find? Oh, you can go on a date with someone, but you can only go on a date with them with one part. So imagine their te a person's teeth across the table, something like that. I was wondering if you had any uh, advice about more being transitioning into gentle, it gently, yeah. That's, that's great, Joseph. I don't know if I'd recommend actually using that one part contemplation on a real date, but it's, that's, a great, that's a great one. Um, yeah, great point. Uh, first, just to re 
reiterate, if you find it's bringing up negative states, these contemplations are really potent. So just feel free to you know, put them down for a time if that's the case, or develop loving kindness. Um, but you know, one thing that Joseph, I think, did actually as well is um, in the Tibetan chode practice, which is body contemplation, they sometimes before they uh, take apart the body, they'll imagine the chitta or the heart rising up out of it. So if you need to kind of imagine that first step of separating out the heart in the sense of, you know, the mind, the, the kind of something immaterial, then that, that can help. But I'd say the elements are a much gentler way for most people to approach it, like you said, because it's, there's a sense of unity very av available there. I mean, the blood is just rainwater. The bones are just earth. There's a sense of real, uh, I find surrender in, in that as well. But yeah, some of the ways you're talking about it, like imagining the blood pumping is just water, that's intuitively sounds very, very potent. Ajahn, any thoughts? Yeah, slight aside. Um, we were on alms round maybe two weeks ago or yeah, a month ago or something. And uh, this gentleman who we didn't know came up and started talking with us and had a lot of interesting questions. He had a lot of you know, dignity to him. And at one point he asks us, so are you guys really celibate? And we say, yeah, we are. And he's like, okay, okay. And he gives us a round of applause. So uh, I just want to give all of you a, a round of applause. That, uh, that is, Ajahn, you go hard sometimes. That was a, that was a deep Dhamma talk. Um, yeah, and what, so one thing that, that Joseph does, if you don't yet know him, he's got a lot of metta, and it is really important to pair this practice of, of loving kindness and softness with like these deep lookings at the body, um, because it can get, it can so easily get morbid or even aversive. Um, so one thing related to blood, which I haven't done in a while, but you can feel your, um, your bud pumping, even when you're not in meditation, just put your hand on your, your wrist and yeah, you can feel the blood there or just on your carotid artery. And you can do this like in the middle of a conversation and you have your hands behind your back or even in front of you and you can just feel your, your pulse and it, it can bring you to whatever you want it and need it to bring you to. It can bring you to, okay, there's just blood here. I'm just, I'm just a human. I'm just a human. This is just just water, this is just blood, and the other person the same, they're just a human, and I don't need to be afraid, there doesn't need to be anxiety, it's just a total normal interaction, um, you know, bringing things back to a really grounded level like that, or just with love, with every kind of lub-dub, lub-dub of the, of the, the artery, of the, the coursing, just bring yourself back to a wish for loving kindness, just may I be happy, may I be happy, so, yeah, really paying attention to that balance and um, feeling and allowing for kindness to go with this practice exactly in tandem. Can we go maybe in person? We've got Kim here. Is it on? Yeah. Um, so sort of drilling down a little on the um, what the word that came to mind is safety or um, you know when this practice is <clears throat> is appropriate, what sort of came up for me is so I think last maybe it was last week's Dhamma talk, you know you, um, we're talking about you know the Buddha gave people the body contemplation, went into the cave, came back, and they had all killed themselves because gross. Um, and so, you know, you're sort of talking about how um, the benefits really come when the, when the mind is calm, right? So when there's already, like, a depth of samadhi and a brightness. And so, so maybe if you could speak to when you know, I mean, you know, you sort of laid it out a little bit, like when the mind is calm and then it starts to move. So maybe talking a little bit about when you know that your samadhi, you know, is really ready, um, when you have that sort of internal 
calm and brightness where these practices can be beneficial. Mm. Um, I found, so I love, element practice is just, you know, next to metta, it's, I love it. Um, and I found today, it was really interesting because maybe this doesn't really matter, but um, I found like I got really activated. I was like, I, maybe it's because of, you know, my um, trauma informed other trainings. And I just was so worried about everybody. I was like, okay, <laughs> like, you know, I couldn't settle into my own element practice, which I love. I love watching my body dissolve into the forest. It's like my happy place. I was so <laughs> concerned about everybody that I found I had to abandon it and go to Metta. And I just like, I was like saran wrapping everybody in Metta. Like, it was funny. I was like, okay, well, my mind just wants to, I'm just like, I could, I was envisioning wrapping everybody. May they experience this peacefully and calmly. And my mind just wanted to do that instead of whatever. So maybe just a little bit of talking about how you know your internal system is ready to work with this practice with, with wisdom and to get the benefits of it. You all got not just a Clear Mountain Gathering, but you got saran wrapped by Kim Metta today. <laughs> that is a rare blessing and a good one. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and yeah, just so people know what Kim's referencing, that uh, the impetus for the Buddha first teaching Anapanasati was the Asuba practice leading to a bunch of monks committing suicide, basically. It's potent. I don't think it'll usually lead people there. Um, so I think one really has to measure um, the effects of this practice by its results in the mind. Because um, for a lot of people, you know, it's great if the mind's able to rest in a calm place and then begin moving. And you can really know it's in a good place for contemplation if when you turn it to one of these contemplations or bring up an, a phrase or an image of the body, it's able to be very systematic and remain focused and kind of interested um, and, and very like intrigued by what it's seeing. There's like a sense of like real interest. That's a great sign, um, especially if it's leading to a sense of brightening. Um, but, you know, first of all, sometimes you're just gonna want these tools. If there's someone at work and you're in a committed relationship and you find your mind keeps going there with them, you want the sword to be able to cut it off fast. And sometimes that might mean taking off their eyelids in your imagination, <laughs> um, you know, but, but like, or for others, it's worth trying, because sometimes the mind, this is a whole realm of truth the mind's never touched. And sometimes it's pretty ready for it and you don't even need that much calm before it'll have quite deep insight. So it's just worth experimenting with a little bit, even from a state of like not that much calm, just see how it feels and what it does to the mind. But be very conscious of your personality type. If you're a very aversive type, then be very careful with this. And track the results over the course of about three days or so. Because often you'll have a really powerful body contemplation meditation, but then the next morning or two days later, you'll feel really, a lot of anger will come up. And that can be the defilement kind of hitting back. And it's such a powerful practice that sometimes the echoes can occur over a few days. So you need to sort of be tracking that and taking it seriously. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd say if there's any sense of aversion, of you know, fear of darkening of the mind, then you just go to metta or move towards you know, elements or something like that. Um, but I'd say, yeah, deep, deep samadhi where it's really systematic and bright and interesting, that's a great sign. But it, if you can't hit that spot all the time, it doesn't mean you can't dip your feet in these waters and see how it, how it feels. Yeah, uh, Ajahn? Yeah, I was doing the same thing as you, Kim. Like every six or seven minutes, I kind of <laughs> look out and, gosh, everybody seems like they're still here. <laughs> kind of amazing. Um, and Ajahn Nisibo's voice is very calm, and you can tell he sounds really nice. And if you don't know him yet, he actually is really nice. <laughs> we live together very closely, and uh, he actually is very nice. And um, and everything that Ajahn Nisibo said, and if you live with someone, if it's a partner, a parent, a child, a friend, 
um, yeah, even someone you don't live with but you're close to, um, who you feel is a wise person, and they give you some kind of feedback that you're kind of getting a little bit off or a little bit, um, a little bit raw, then really taking that into account, because it, it's quite possible for us to um, yeah, do a practice which we think is everything is hunky-dory, everything's going well, but then we start reacting with um, yeah, a bit more reactivity or a bit of an edge. This, this practice can really bring an edge to it that um, our friends can help point out even if we don't see it, so. Um, yeah, I a, well, there's there's a Zoom question. I, I also had a question of my own, if that's all right. Um, on meta meditation, which seems like a natural con complement to these contemplations, um, I've been practicing it myself for a while now, um, and it it still feels feeble compared to these other meditation techniques. Um, the approach I've been taking is to think about friends, think about my cats, and then the feeling I get from that, focus on sustaining and amplifying that feeling. It seems to go well with um, breath meditation, concentration. So it's it's working, it's helpful. I'm just wondering if, there, if you have any other quick and easy suggestions that I could try to maybe make it work better. No, I think paying attention to um, that feeling like it's it's working, and then just, just staying with that. So much of samadhi is not being on the cutting edge and having like the newest technique, or really it's not, it needs to have the right amount of creativity. Your, your meditation, your practice in general, it has to have the right amount of creativity. If uh, things get too dull and you're just doing it in a rote way, then um, yeah, practice dries out, but um, yeah, if you bring too much creativity, you always want to find like the latest idea. Okay, how else can I think of this um, to, yeah, fix my practice? Then, yeah, that's that won't lead to a, a mind that settles either. So, yeah, paying attention to um, that, and if it's your cat or a dog or just some kind of family member that really brings very ready, ready sense of of well-being and ease, um, then then sticking with that. So. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, paying attention to that, that sense of rightness. Okay, thank you. Yeah.